Hello, so this is the intro. This is just a super quick summary over what we went over for the unit in order to prepare for the test. Um, I'm doing this off my laptop, so bear with me as my handwriting it might be worse than usual. So quick introduction, so percents. Any time that percents are involved, we're looking at a part per whole. There are some unique situations where we're looking at a part to part, but we're gonna get that as we get more complicated into the next unit. Um, but here, what I want you to take a look at is when we're starting with percents, we need to identify what is our part and what is our whole. And we're going to do that during the test. Now, the reason I wrote this value up here is to show different place values. Um, normally, variables are used to show uh, different unique values. But what I'm trying to show, because students made this mistake, is uh, different place values. So x is in the hundreds place, y is in the tenths place. So there would be. Um, there's going to be a decimal here in a second. Uh, and then Z, and, and actually right here, I'm sorry. X is in the hundreds place. Y is in the tens place, like 10, 20, 30, 40. And Z is in the ones place. So when we look at how many parts per whole, most of the time we're looking at less than 100 parts per 100. And that's going to give us a percent. Not always. Sometimes we could be looking at 400 parts per 100. That means that we're looking at an increase. But anyway, so here what I'm showing is that when you convert this fraction into a decimal, that you need to move the decimal um, two places away from the ones place so that the tens place becomes now the tenths place. So this y that was in the tens place becomes y in the tenths place. And this becomes important because if we look at something like 3%, which we will look at in the test, 3% looks like this, but as a decimal, it looks like this. And students often make the mistake is as um, in converting this to a decimal as just leaving it as three or uh, converting three hundredths or three percent into 0 0.3. 0 0.3 is 30 percent. So if students can really visualize that this is the ones place and in front of that three or two imaginary zeros and they need to do that because the hundreds place hundredths place when they divide by a hundred they're going to move the decimal two spots here and there's a more complicated explanation for that but right now i'm just trying to activate some sort of memory they have from or you have as a student if you're watching this from um fifth grade it was where percents were, were focused on quite a bit so here you move the decimal um so three point six two and so this percent that decimal no longer exists anymore right and we go back to the percent here so this right here um, would be three percent because we would use the value just like we did over a hundred to show our percent the decimal only exists right here when we're using it in math um, to have a calculation so we're multiplying or dividing the percent for whatever reason we need to we're using the decimal version of it not the percent version of it. Now we can also use the fraction and I encourage students if they if they run into problems converting percents into decimals that they activate their fraction knowledge and just keep it as a as a as a fraction because you can still multiply instead of multiplying a number by point I'm sorry point zero three to find three percent of it you can also multiply that number by three hundredths because these two are exactly the same thing. So if your student does a much better job with fractions or students, if you do a much better job with fractions, just keep it as a fraction. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, okay, so then now we're here at proportional ratios. Uh, in a proportional ratio, the problem will give you a quantity of, of two values and say that they're related proportionally or something of that nature. There's a constant rate of increase or they are uh, related by a common factor and they will give you two values. Then they will give you a scenario where one of those values is missing and then they will give you a new either bigger or smaller value. And in order to find the proportion, you need to find the constant of proportionality or some sort of common factor. Constant of proportionality is when we reduce it to a rate of one. Um, but in every case, you're going to be looking for a factor. So there's going to be a common number that we either multiply or divide by to go from one ratio to another. 
And if this feels like it's something that you've done before as a student, it's because every time that you converted, let's say to add fractions and you needed to convert one half into fourths because you needed to add it to, you know, seven fourths over here, converting this into fourths, you knew that you had to double the denominator, which means you have to double the numerator. So equivalent fractions is the same thing as proportional ratios. So when you are trying to find equivalent fractions, you're having to, let's say you um, needed to add one third plus two sevenths, right? You need to convert the thirds into 21sts and the, seven, the sevenths into 21sts. You would use this style of calculation to convert those fractions into fractions with common denominators. So students have been doing this for a while, just not necessarily in this context, okay? So we're gonna move on pretty quick here because these fractions, uh, these ratios, excuse me, do not have to be represented as fractions here. They could be represented as a ratio of X to Y, and then they will give you some unknown or some known value here. Let me undo that. Just trying to draw uh, excuse me, uh, question mark. Some unknown value here and then some value here. And you're trying to find what factor do you either multiply or divide by to get from the previous part of your ratio to a new part of your ratio. And then you use that same factor to multiply or divide by here. So I allowed students to solve proportional ratios in a, in a multitude of ways. Um, so stack here like a fraction, here like a ratio separated by a colon. Also, I encourage students, if they needed to, to use a table. And they could, uh, instead of keeping things separated as a colon, which might be confusing, they could put their values in a table or divide by the common factor and find missing values in a table. That would be totally fine by me. So let's go ahead and get to the test. So that was the introduction. Here is problem one. So in problem one, the, uh, everyone was given a table. These are actual statistics, I think from 2012 uh, Summer Olympics and the number of gold medals for four different countries. And they were given the number of total medals for those same four different countries. And then they were asked questions about this. So the first question is looking for a ratio of United States gold medals. So we come up here to United States gold medals, and that's 46, to Russia gold medals. So we go to Russia, and their gold medals are 24, and says um, that they were related by a ratio of about some unknown number to one. So in class, I let the students know that we were looking for a number here. We're looking for a value. Is it 6 to 1, 5 to 1, 0.5 to 1? So we're looking for some sort of constant of proportionality here. And what this student did, and I accidentally cut it off when I took a screenshot, is they... <coughs> Darn it. Sorry about that. So what they did, and actually this calculation is just a little bit wrong because this should have been divided by 24 here. They set up a ratio of United States gold medals, which was 46, and compared that to Russia gold medals, which was 24. And here, you, you see where it has divided by 2 over here, and it's really supposed to be divided by 24, and I, I just cut it off. It's my fault. So what they did is they figured out, okay, to get this ratio, I need to somehow get to 1, because that 1 is here in this ratio, so I'm going to divide by 24. And so they also divided 46 by 24. And when they did, they got 1.16. Now, if I was being super picky, I would ask the student, you know, to uh, to round that because the question did say about. Um, but this is this is fine for me. They did all the math correctly, so to them, it is about 1.916 to 1. So setting up the ratio, reducing it by the common factor of 24, uh, we end up with about 2 to 1. And actually, technically, this is an estimate, too, because that 6 is repeating. So this is a good answer for me. Um, this would be part of the process to get there, at least one of the ways to do it. 1B, same table, 
different question. Canada had about. Now, at this point, uh, I had conversations with every class about numbers not making sense here. So Canada had about five as many. That wouldn't make sense. Had about two as many. None of that makes sense. So I gave the students kind of a menu of options. So I told them we're looking for um, a multiple. So we could say four times as many, half, half as many, twice as many. So it's going to be some sort of phrase like that. It's not just going to be a number by itself. So this is why you see my little note here. But the student did it correctly. They figured out how many total medals, we're looking at total medals, Canada had. And they divided that by the total number of medals that Australia had. And they found out that it's half. Now, if for some reason, if the student accidentally did it the other way and did 35 divided by 18 and got some value 2, they need to recognize that we are, con we are comparing Canada, which has a smaller amount, to Australia, which has a larger amount. And saying that Canada has about twice as many medals would be incorrect because this is where paying attention to the order that the um, countries are listed in the question. So order is very important here. So answers like twice as many would, would be very wrong because they have to recognize the direction here. So about half as many, perfect. And you would do that just with division of one value divided by the other value. So this is almost like a percent. So here we go, part C. Part C, we're given the question explicitly in percent. So about what percent of Australia's total medals were gold? So then now we're looking for a part-to-part -part ratio. Uh, sorry, a part-to-whole ratio. So we look at Australia, and we see their total medals, which includes seven gold medals. So seven is the part, 35 is the whole. Now, this student solved this in, a, in kind of a unique way. They used some kind of back backtracking logic here. So their answer of 20% is correct. And their reasoning is that 7 goes into 35 five times. And if it goes into five times, I just need to find five equal chunks of 100 because they understand that percents are per 100. So if I take, and they, they wrote this wrong, but that's okay. I understand. Well, it's not okay. I would love the student to correct it. But for testing purposes, I'm understanding where they're trying to get to. So they're trying to do 100 divided by 5, and they find that 100 divides into 5, uh, I'm sorry, 100, yes, 100 divides into 5 equal chunks of 20. Therefore, as a percent, one-fifth of 100 is 20, so that's 20 parts per 100, which is 20%. We're going to see uh, a student that did this more directly. But here, the student, I believe, earned 100% of the points for the problem because I can logically see that they're using their understanding of percents to get their answer. And yes, nope. Yeah, so if I wanted to see exactly uh, how to do this in the more direct way, I would take and I'm going to write over the top of this thing, or actually I'm going to put, give me a second to do a new slide. Nope, it's going to take too long. So hold on. Okay. So a more direct way to do this would be to understand where the parts and where the holes set it up as a as a fraction so seven parts out of 35 total metals seven of them were gold student could reduce this down by dividing by seven divide by seven and then we'll get an equivalent ratio of one fifth now they might just know that one fifth is 0.2 that's fine. They would put this in a calculator, 1 divided by 5, and they would get 0.2. Either way, they need to get to 0.2, convert that to a percentage, which would be 20%. And then their answer would be that Australia's gold medals compared to their total medals uh, was 20%. So 20% of their total medals were gold.
and this would be one way to do it. Now they could skip this step here and actually in their calculator put uh, type in 7 divided by 35 and they'll of course also get 0.2. So they did not have to reduce it. But for some students, reducing it to one-fifth might absolutely eliminate the need for a calculator because they know one-fifth is 0.2. All right, on to problem three. Oh, problem two, excuse me. So problem two, they're given this information. So this is the ratio that they're given. They're given 64 pretzels to 16 ounces. So they need to recognize that. This student set up their ratio side to side separated by a colon, properly labeled, perfect. So I know which one's the pretzels and which one's the ounces. Um, they needed to write and solve a proportion that they could use to find the number of chocolate covered pretzels in a five ounce bag. So they need to go from 16 ounces to five ounces. And what this student did is they said, okay, they most likely used a calculator and they tried to figure out what number would I have to divide 16 by to get to five. So they just did the reverse. They divided 16 by five and found out that it was 3.2. So that means 16 divided by 3.2 is going to give them 5. And if you use that common factor on the number of pretzels, you go, you do 64 divided by 3.2 and you get 20. So therefore, in a 5 ounce bag, there are 20 pretzels. And they also went ahead and wrote their answer uh, separately to make sure that it was super clear. Here's another student that set it up in a table. They set up 64 pretzels in 16 ounces. And then what they did is they reduced it to a, a unit rate. So here they divided by 16 and then found out that if they divide 16 by one, they end up with one. And if they divide 64 by 16, they get four. So in that, the reason they did that is because that unit rate is going to be pretty easy to use to get up to five because now they just need to multiply by five to get from one to five. Sorry, that's an arrow, not a two. And then they multiply four by five to get to 20. Therefore, in a five ounce bag, there are 20 pretzels. So this is another way of finding it out and they showed all their work along the way. 2B, so what are the number of chocolate covered pretzels per ounce? Now this student actually did the work for the um, previous problem, but just to make sure they got full credit, they showed the work again, and then they wrote out their answer. The number of chocolate covered pretzels per ounce is four. So they took the number of pretzels divided by the number of ounces, and they got the number of pretzels per ounce. So when you take the number of pretzels, which was 64, divide it by the total number of ounces, you will get the pretzels per ounce. Um, here for part C, how much does each pretzel weigh? So here we do the reverse. We take the number of ounces, and then we find out how many ounces per pretzel. Now this student didn't quite see that, um, see that fraction. So what they did is they said, hey, if there's four pretzels, one, two, three, four pretzels in a single ounce, there's, um, they got that from a problem B, that there are four pretzels per ounce. If I divided up that ounce into four equal parts, what would I get? And dividing one into four equal parts is 0.25. So they figured out that each pretzel must be a quarter of an ounce. All right. And let's see, I think we have another student that did it differently. Yep. So here's part B again, what number of chocolate covered pretzels per ounce? This student did the calculations over here. And then I think what happened here is they figured out that it was um, a quarter ounce per pretzel. And then they used that ratio from a question in the future to actually answer the question here. So they knew it was 25 or a quarter of an ounce per pretzel. So if they wanted to know how much one ounce was, they had to multiply by four. So one quarter times four would equal one, so that's one ounce. One pretzel times four equals four pretzels, so there must be four pretzels in every ounce. They went ahead and wrote the answer here separately to make sure that their answer was clear, perfect. And then all the work down here is taking the number of ounces divided by pretzels. So it's kind of odd they use the answer from the previous problem to answer this one. So it seems like there was some circular logic. They were um, solving basically all of the answers for this problem at kind of at the same time and then using those answers to prove themselves. The fact that they're using common factors is perfect. That's what we're looking for.
So to get from one ratio to another ratio using common factors, awesome. So that was number two. Here we are in number three. Here, students, I, I told them they did not have to show a lot of calculations. A lot of this was going to be calculator work, and this student got most of them right except for this one. And while the student got the answer correct, this error is actually pretty interesting because what they did is they noticed that we're increasing by fives here every time. So they increased by $2.25, $2.25. What they didn't recognize is that the jump from 20 to 100 was a multiple of five. So they needed to multiply $9 by five to get a value of $45 here. All right, so this table was, they, they missed this one entry in the table, but that was part A. So all of those answers are correct, except for the last one, which should be 45. Uh, part B, how many peppers could you buy for $20? Many students erroneously saw 20 up here, but that's the number of peppers. That is not the number of dollars. They get 20 peppers for $9 here. What this student did is they said, hey, wait a minute, I have a unit rate right here and my unit rate is one pepper. They said pretzels, but it's that that's common. They just got pretzels from the previous problem. They mean peppers. So one pepper for 45 cents. And they need to somehow get from 45 cents to $20. And they're gonna use whatever factor it takes to get from 45 cents to $20, and they're gonna use that same factor to find the number of pretzels. And the factor that they found was 44.4. Now it is, most likely that they entered that into the calculator. They said, how many times does 45 cents go into $20? They found out it was 44.4, I think it was 0.4 repeating. And that's how they got this factor. So they knew if they divide 20 by 0.45, that the number that they got, they could take 20 divided by that other number and get 4.5, which means they can take 4.5 and multiply it by this factor to get to 20. So what I just said might seem a little confusing. So if you take 12 and I wanna know how do I get from 12 to three, well then I say, well, if I divide 12 by three, I get four. Therefore, if I divide 12 by four, I get three. So it's just figuring out the missing pieces of a factor triangle. So you might recognize this from, from elementary school that four, uh, I'm sorry, 12, divided by four is three, 12 divided by three is four, because four times three is 12. So you might see you know, this triangle from, from elementary school. But the correct answer here is 44. I did ask the student to round because they're not gonna let you buy four tenths of a pretzel. pretzel. So for $20, a student would be able to buy 44 pretzels because we use the same factor on this side. So that was number three. There were other parts to number three, but because we did not study equations in our unit, equations and graphing, I went ahead and gave those points to students. So every student should have gotten those last three uh, parts to number three correct because they were written up on the board. So now we're on to number four. Number four, we're talking percents here. And this time, we're not trying to find a percent of a number. We're going to use a percent to find a new number. Now, this student didn't quite use proportions to solve their, their answer. Instead, what they said is that they knew, or what they showed, is that they knew we're starting off with $47,000. That's what we're starting off in 2011. And we were going to get a 3% raise. So in this section, what they did is said, okay, if I'm going to get a 3% raise, then I'm going to get 3% more. So if I find out what 3% of 47,000 is, which they did here, I just need to add that to 47,000 and I'm going to get my new value. Perfect. That's one way of doing it. Uh, over here on the right, what they said is, okay, what if I just found 1% of 47,000 and then I tripled that because I can do that because 3% is three times of one, three times 1%. And then add those together, I'm gonna to get my final answer of $48,410 after my 3% raise. That's totally fine. Neither one of these methods actually used ratios, proportions, ratios or proportions to solve the answer, but it shows an understanding of how percents work. And then here, 
finding a 1% and then multiplying it by 3 is, is very much ratio-like. So the student got full credit. Another way of solving this problem, oh, another way of solving this problem that we that we did in class, something I was looking forward to, and a lot of students didn't quite see this. Maybe we just didn't get enough practice with it, but 47,000 is to 100 percent as an unknown number. Oops, why do I always do a two when I mean a question mark? As some unknown number after the raise is to 103%. So 103% is 3% more than 100%. And to get here, you multiply by 1.03. If I multiply 100 times 1.03, I will go from 100 to 103. And then I'm going to use this factor to find my missing number here, times 1.03. Three. So a student would be able to find their answer in one step by multiplying by 1.03. This is going to be really important as we study the distributive property and see how we do how we go from this student solution, which is two separate parts and then combining into one, to this solution of being able to multiply by just 1.03. So any way any of those three ways to solve this problem would be fantastic. I would prefer the one that I did in blue. Problem five. Problem five, this was a difficult one. Um, I tried to support students by explaining this as best I could without giving away the answer in class. And this student found one of many ways to, to answer this question. So we're given two different paint mixes. One where five parts of white are used for every two parts of red. So that may, might be pints, gallons, quarts, whatever it might be, but it would be, let's say, even two cups. Two cups of red paint for every five cups of white paint. It's just a part-to-part -part ratio um, for whatever mix, however much paint we need. could be gallons. Plan B uses four parts white for every one part red. Now, there are, I think, six or seven different ways to use ratios and proportions to answer this. We're not going to go over all of them. This student wrote down ratios for plan B and ratios for plan A. And what they decided to do was to create an equivalent ratio for plan B, I'm sorry, for plan A, um, in a way that it used the same number of parts of red as plan B did. So they divided it by two. They said if plan A looked like plan B, it would have one part red for every two and a half parts white. So that's red and that's white. And if that's true, then plan A would have far less uh, um, white. So it would only have two and a half parts of white for every one part of red, where plan B has four parts of white, a lot more white, for every one part of red. So in their explanation, they said plan B has to be less red than plan A, because plan B has a lot more white for every one part red. Plan A has just less or a little bit less white for every one part red. So if you have more white than you have red, that means you are less red. So plan B is less red because there is more white than plan A. And what they mean is not more white in general, they mean more white for every one part of red. Okay. This is, this is a tough one. This is really taking their understanding of ratios and asking for a pretty strong application of it. Um, you could have gone the other direction. You could have said, instead of making plan A look like plan B, you could try to make plan B look like plan A by doubling. So we would have eight to every two red. And if that's the case, then we still end up in the same boat. Plan B has way more white for every part red than plan A does. So if plan B has more white per red, that means it's less red. Okay. Now, the you could have done that with white. I did say I'm not going to go over every one of them, just one more. So we could have made the whites equivalent and said, I'm going to multiply this times 5. And let me just thicken up the pen a little bit so this might be easier to see. So here, I'm going to multiply by 5 and I'm going to get 20 parts white. And if I do that, 
plan B is going to have five parts red because one times five is five. For plan A, I'm going to multiply five times four to get 20 parts white. And I'm going to multiply two times four to get eight parts red. And here, for the same number of parts of white, you can see that plan B has fewer parts red. This is another way of seeing it. No matter how we do our ratios, as long as we're using equivalent factors to adjust our ratios so that they're at some point equal, either equal in white or equal in red, we could have also done percentages of the total amount of paint used, we would see that red is the, that plan B is always going to have less red as a proportion to white or as a relation to white. Okay, a um, couple different ways of doing that one. Here we are, number six, almost done. The train ride uh, at the zoo covers a distance of two and a half miles in one third of an hour. So this, I think, was far less complicated than most students saw because one third of an hour, hour is one of three parts of an hour. So if I want to know how many miles per one hour the train goes, I simply multiply my ratio that I was given before by three. So two and a half times three is seven and a half. And this student did a great job of stating their answer separately, seven and a half miles per hour. That's absolutely correct. You just multiply the ratio that you're given by three. And the ratio we're given is two and a half miles in one third of an hour. For six B, they give us three again, except for now they're saying um, the train is going to travel for a total of three hours. You could have gone from the original ratio or used the ratio like this student did from part A. They said if the train can go seven and a half miles in one hour, I just need to multiply that times three and I'm going to get my new distance. And that's exactly what they did after three hours and a great restatement of their answer. Um, they went 22 and a half miles in three hours. That's it. Basically, both parts of part six is multiplying by three. Number seven, this student chose a very unique way of solving this problem. We needed to find a, a percent of a value, and that value is eight cups. In the problem, Nancy wants to create a bird seed mix in her bird feeder. Now, the mix, she's given two different types of seeds, wild bird seed and sunflower seed, and the mix needs to be 20% wild bird seed and 80% sunflower seed. It doesn't tell her how much. It's just giving her a, a proportional ratio, two to eight or one to four, 20% to 80%, okay? Her bird feeder can hold eight cups. So here's where we're given the total amount of space that she can use. And the total amount of space is eight cups. And what we need to find out is how much bird seed, wild bird seed specifically, can she fit in that eight cup container? So that's the question. How much wild bird seed does she need to fill the container? Well, wild bird seed in our ratio here, or as a percent of total, is 20%. So here's how I expected most students to solve this problem. They would say, I need 20% of eight cups. Then I would just multiply 0.2 times 8, and I would get 1.6 cups of wild bird seed. That solves the problem. Now what this student decided to do was they just, they converted the cups to ounces. And they figured out that there's 8 ounces in a cup, and if I've given eight cups, therefore I have 64 ounces. And then they found percents of 64. Now they did that all in a calculator. I rewrote this up here just to verify that their calculations were correct. Um, so that's 20% of 64 ounces. They show that 64 ounces represents eight cups. And then their answer for wild bird seed is right there. They restated their answer. Perfect. So they absolutely unnecessarily converted to ounces. But it still works. It still works. 12.8 ounces is 1.6 cups. This is totally fine. Um, one more step than necessary, but again, it gets to the correct answer, which is awesome. So how I did it in the lower half of the problem would be totally acceptable as well. Just 20% of eight cups. So that's what this person did. And this student unfortunately made a couple errors 
One of them is here. You can see that they found the 20% and 80% of eight cups. So you can see that they're on the right track. They're totally on the right track here. Um, one thing that they missed was the decimal. So just multiplying by the percent is insufficient. They need to multiply by the decimal version of the percent because that then changes these answers to have a decimal in them. And 1.6 cups, which is right here, should be the wild bird seed amount. 1.6 cups. However, I think because those decimals were missing, they had a misunderstanding of the what the numbers meant that they were looking at. Because for their answer, they said that she needed two, yeah, Nancy, she needed two cups of wild bird seed, but it's not two cups. It's 1.60. And the student even had the calculations here to show the correct answer, but unfortunately stated it incorrectly in their answer here and was missing a couple of decimals. And I think that's why they got the answer incorrect. Um, so again, multiplying 0.2 times 8 to get 1.6. Finally, this answer, um, if you're in first period, you most likely do not have this set up. And somehow I neglected first period um, to set this up for students. Every other class I gave students all of this info oops this info this info as well because this is a very complicated problem so I wanted to give the students as much setup as I could to help solve the problem so first period because I didn't give you this setup everyone in first period got um, bonus points for even giving this a try which means they probably got full credit for this if they just gave it a try um, because I didn't even give you anything to start with. Everyone else, I gave you this framework to start with. So what were they, what were students expected to find out using this framework? Let me go ahead and clear the board. Okay. They were not given this number, so they had to figure this out, and students were not given this number. Now, what we what we what we found out is that, or from the problem, what we know is that the mix that Paul needs to create for his weed whacker fuel is an oil and gas mixture where it's one eighth part oil and four parts gasoline. So here's where it gets a little mind bendy for students. The part doesn't tell you what amount, it doesn't tell you gallons or quarts or cups or, oun or ounces really, all right? We only get that from additional information later in the problem. But what this means is let's say it was a quart. So you would do an eighth of a quart oil and four quarts gasoline. So whatever the, the amount is, if it's gallon, gallons, you would do one eighth of a gallon oil, but four gallons of gasoline. So this is the a very fractional part versus four whole number parts of a different value. So a fractional part of oil and four whole number or multiple parts of gasoline. Now here's where they give us the information, but they give it to us in two steps. So they say Paul has a 32 ounce container of oil and he's only going to use one eighth of it. So this is where I set this up for students. I said, hey, look, let's figure out how much oil he's going to use. And he's going to use four ounces of oil because his container is 32 ounces and he's going to use an eighth of it. Therefore, he's going to use four ounces of oil. So we need to take our proportional ratio and take it down to four ounces. Once we know that we can get to one from one eighth of a part all the way down to four ounces, then we'll know how much gas we're using. All right. So yeah, it's a complicated question. So this is really, if students are understanding this question, they have a, a fluent understanding of ratios and proportions. So what this student says is, hey, I'm trying to get to four ounces here. So I need to get out of fractions to whole numbers. So that I need to get from here to here and I'm going to get there by multiplying by 8. Therefore, I take my four parts, and now I know for every one part of oil, I'm going to need 32 parts of gas. So now we're not working with fractions anymore. For every one part oil, I'm going to use 32 parts gas. Makes sense, hopefully. Now we're going to go from one part to four parts by multiplying by 4. So we're going to multiply by 4. So 32 times 4 is 128. So then we know for every four parts of oil, I'm going to use 128 parts of gasoline.
Now, we know we don't have to call them parts anymore because we know we're working in ounces. So for every four ounces of oil, I'm going to use 128 ounces of gasoline. And if I'm going to use four ounces of oil and 128 ounces of gasoline to answer the question, how large of a container is he going to need for his mixture? We need to add those together and we get a 132 ounce container. All right. So this student used the setup, recognized the ratios and was able to come up with the with the answer here. Um, if your student didn't, this is a really complicated question. Uh, a lot of students did not get this correct, um, but it's because it was it's a very high level application uh, question. And that's why I tried to scaffold it as much as I could to give them a framework to work from. So that's it for the test. Um, your student will just need to, or students, you will need to create a video of what you did wrong, uh, how to fix it. If you just had a complete misunderstanding of the problem, you can start off with that and just say, I didn't even know where to start. And now I know that I need to set up ratios and find a common factor or whatever it is that you need to do to, to get that problem right. Send me in a video. Uh, one video for a problem. So if the problem has multiple parts, in order for it to count, you got to show all multiple parts uh, in your video. But there are eight separate questions on the test. Pick one that you got wrong, make a good video explaining how to do it correctly, and I would love to give you extra points for that. So have a great day, and hopefully you found the video helpful.